Welcome to section 2.2 um, from chapter 2 in Open Text Astronomy, where we are going to talk about the very beginnings of astronomy, uh, covering the roots all the way back to um, ancient Egypt and Babylon, and focusing on what the ancient Greeks were able to figure out. The next video that we'll see in order is going to skip past the astrology section of the book. It's worth reading, but we're not going to have a separate uh, lecture video on it and it will talk about uh, section 2.4. All right, so when we think about the very beginnings of astronomy, um, people who go into researching all of that period of history where there's very little to be able to actually go on, um, very little re recorded writings, um, this is typically called archaeoastronomy, the very beginning parts. And one of the things that's worth recognizing is because the stars have always been there, as long as humans have been there, astronomy is really one of the oldest sciences, if not the single oldest science. And if we think about how humans uh, as a species went from hunter-gatherers to be able to settle down and actually cultivate food plants to feed themselves and domesticate animals, one of the biggest reasons that that was able to work is that there were at least some people paying attention to the cycles of the sky to know when the best time to plant food would be and when the best time to harvest that food would be so that everyone could actually feed themselves. And so the prediction of seasons is one of the aspects of the very beginning civilizations. Now, the first recorded writings that we have are from ancient Egypt, where we have hieroglyphics on papyrus, and ba ancient Babylon, where we have cuneiform on clay tablets. The first preserved written paper documents are from um, ancient Greece, and that's really where our textbook picks up. But I wanted to comment at least on these uh, starting points. Because the Egyptians have the oldest recorded constellations, and they were used to be able to note the different patterns that were easily recognizable in the sky to be able to measure the passage of time. So for example, the bright star Sirius, which the Egyptians called Sothos, because it rises earlier and earlier each day, when it first started to appear or be um, visible in the nighttime skies, so at sunset when we could actually see it, that was roughly the time of year when the Nile would flood. And so this helped um, not only know we need to um, collect all of our harvest before the Nile floods everything, but they were also able to recognize that this process happened one day um, later every four years. And so the ancient Egyptians actually knew about leap years um, back in 1500 before Common Era. Now keep in mind that this was the beginning of astronomy, but it was definitely also the beginning of astrology. Imagine that you are one of those priest class priest class astronomers, and you go and tell people, hey, next week the Nile is going to flood, and then it happens. If they don't understand that your knowledge is being, um, is based on observations that you're making, it seems like you've got this mystical power of prediction that is really impressive and a little bit scary. And so astrology, this idea of adding extra mythical meaning to standard scientific observations, it has the same roots that astronomy, the science, does. And the Babylonians expanded on this. They created their entire religion around astrology, and they had a lot of people devoted to just paying attention to the moon phases and the sun rising and setting locations and where all of the planets were um, at all points. And so there's a lot of preserved recordings of things like the location of Jupiter from one night to the next. Now, things changed at least a little bit with the rudimentary invention of what we now start to think of the principles of science. If we think back to chapter one, our modern understanding of science requires us to have testable and verifiable ideas and be willing to put those ideas to the test and throw out bad ones. And so the ancient Greek scholars, um, they did go through, in a lot of ways, they did go through this process of coming up with ideas and seeing if they match the world around them. There's also things that they got wrong um, because they didn't um, test those ideas. But let's start with a list of the things that they got right. And I'm focusing on like the 400s before Common Era to about the 100s before Common Era.
We don't need to memorize these dates, but it's worth having a sense of when all of this is happening. So for example, the, the first big thing that ancient Greek scholars knew is that the earth is round. Now, it is a common myth that at the time of Christopher Columbus sailing the world, that people didn't know that the earth was round and thought that he would fall off the edge. And that is a myth. That is not true. Uh, ancient Greek scholars knew that the earth was round. There are several kind of very basic observations that one can do to recognize that that's only possible if the earth is round. So Aristotle's two biggest reasons um, that are worth commenting on is that when we have a lunar eclipse, and we will be talking about the two types of eclipses at the end of chapter four, when we have a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the earth is always a circular shadow. And the only object that no matter how you turn it always creates a circular shadow is a sphere. The other thing that ancient Greek scholars were able to um, test this with is if you change your location on earth moving north or south enough, you will see stars moving differently. Stars will become visible to you that weren't before if you start to travel south from Greece. Stars will be higher in the sky um, and the north star will be higher in the sky if you go further north in Greece. And we talked about some of these things back in section 2.1. For example, the north star being at the horizon at the equator, at the zenith at the North Pole, and somewhere in between for places like the continental United States. Aristotle and um, his uh, contemporaries were able to know that as well. Another thing that the ancient Greeks were able to um, think about was the approximate physical size of the Earth. I am not going to go through the details of the experiment shown on the slide here. The picture is from our textbook and you can read up um, a little bit more in the textbook if you're curious, but we don't need to know the details for this course. But the two key things that are worth noting here is Erasthenes came up with this experiment. So we are going through this scientific method of having an idea and testing it. And this experiment required an understanding that the earth was round. So Aristotle figured this out and Erasthenes is like, okay, it's round, now we can do this experiment. It also required that one of the two locations that we are um, making measurements at, so we have Syene and Alexandria, one of the two locations has to be close enough to the equator that the sun can actually be directly overhead on a given day out of the year. Now, it is very important for us to be aware of, especially when we get into this idea in chapter four, that in the continental United States, we are too far north of the equator. And it is worth understanding that Greece itself is too far north of the equator as well. We had to be talking to people and um, communicating with someone who was um, far enough south, so below the Tropic of Cancer on the globe, to be able to have the sun um, be directly overhead at any time of year. So again, there's more in the textbook if you're curious, and we'll be talking about that sun angle idea in um, chapter four separately when we talk about seasons. And then the last really big impressive thing that ancient Greeks were able to figure out is that the Earth's tilt is not this nice stable location. It's always at roughly 23.5 degrees, but that tilt wobbles kind of like a top does. And so it points at different stars um, over the course of time. Now, the reason this is so impressive is because one big circle of the wobble, basically, this is a um, process known as precession. That time takes 26,000 years to complete one of these wobbles. And so the only reason that Hipparchus figured it out is because he was cataloging stars and looking back at star catalogs from thousands of years prior. And when he was comparing with this earlier data, there was so much information about this star called Thuban that is not all that bright and not all that important in where it is in the sky. But what he realized was thousands of years prior Thuban was the star that was closest to the North Celestial Pole, and so it was originally, at that time, the North Star. 
At this current time, Polaris is a very good North Star. It's almost perfectly lined up with the North Celestial Equator. And that's actually just a big um, coincidence for us. If we wait 13,000 years, so let's put ourselves into cryosleep just for this. If we wait 13,000 years, the star Vega, which is much brighter than Polaris, will actually be our brand new North Star. Um, and we'll have stars be all the same relative to each other. But what we think of as the North Star and how the stars move over the course of our sky will change. It's worth noting then that this procession, this wobble, is the big reason why astrology as the ancient Babylonians set it up no longer is a perfect fit to where the sun and planets are over the course of the year now. Because we are pointing at a slightly different location and where the sun is at um, on you know, March 6th is different now than it was um, thousands of years ago. And so all of those different star signs that we're familiar with don't quite line up because we are using the original astrology rather than what astronomy, the science, should tell us. But I don't want us to get too comfortable with the ancient Greeks just figuring out all of science um, thousands and thousands of years ago they had some really fundamental problems as well. One of the biggest issues was that even though we're starting to build this idea of science, there are still some ideas that weren't tested, weren't verified, because everyone just knew that they were true. They were basically truths that hadn't been proven. So, spoiler alert, these two statements are not true. One, the Earth is the most important and therefore is at the center of everything. Everybody in ancient Greece, almost everybody, everybody in ancient Greece and Rome and all of these um, cultures, they had no reason to think otherwise. And so Earth was placed at the center of any model where we had all of these um, sky objects moving. This is called a geocentric model. That word geocentric means Earth-centered. Then the other big thing that um, we stuck around with is that the circle is a perfect shape and the heavens are a perfect place, and so everything must move in perfect circles. So exact circles. And so the most famous model that came out of all of this is the one put together by Ptolemy, where we put the Earth at the center, and then all of the planets and the moon and the sun all orbited in circles around and away from the Earth. The problem with this is that even simple models of just making a bunch of concentric circles do not work because sometimes the planets seem like they move backwards through our sky if we track their location from one night to the next over the course of like weeks or months. This motion, this backwards apparent motion is called retrograde motion and it happens when we catch up and pass a slower planet. It is really just based on our perspective. And so for example, Mars goes through retrograde motion, and you can um, look up online if you want to uh, Mars retrograde motion and see a whole bunch of different pictures um, that I can't put here for copyright issues. But um, for retrograde motion, this was something that it was visibly known, even in ancient Babylon, in um, ancient Rome, all these places. And so Ptolemy's model couldn't be perfect, um, just simple circles. Instead, what he had to do was add circles on circles. These extra set of circles are called epicycles. And so it's shown here on the slide that things went around the Earth, but not quite. And then they went on their own little circle. And so as they were going around the big circle, they were also going around smaller circles. And maybe we're thinking to ourselves, that seems kind of complicated. What's even worse is that to get the planets in the correct positions, because our observations were quite good at the location of actual planet positions, in many cases we needed like 6 to 11 layers of these smaller and smaller circles to get the planet right where it's supposed to be. So hopefully we think that that sounds ridiculous, but again, if we are forced to use that fundamental truth that we have to use circles, that's the only way to do it. We will talk in chapter three about how we fixed that. But the key thing is that with this new circles and circles um, model, with the earth at the center, 
That model lasted for a thousand years, this geocentric model. And everyone believed it and everyone just treated it as absolute truth, right? We're kind of losing track of this science nature of things and it became a belief, a fundamental belief. And so it was eventually accepted as authoritative, um, authoritative fact, unquestionable truth in Christian Europe, which is why it took over um, a thousand years for anyone to sit down and be willing to question it. And we will talk in the next section about what happens when people start to question this geocentric model. So that will be for section 2.4. I will see you then.